Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Words play a huge part of the repertoire and career of today's guest. He's an acclaimed songwriter and musician, born and raised in Paramus, New Jersey, USA in 1955. From purchasing his first guitar from Manny's Music, he went on to play weddings and bar mitzvahs as part of a band. He went on to study music at City College of New York, where he was mentored by musician David Brumberg. After signing his first music contract, he went on to write and perform the single Ariel, which went on to become a US Billboard hit in 1977. The next year, his duet Lucky Stars with Denise Marsa went on to become a top three UK single with performances on Top of the Pops and other music television shows. He's released several albums, performed live around the world and released other well-known songs, which have been used for film, television, advertising, and get regular radio play. A very warm UK Your Take welcome to musician Dean Friedman, who talks about his life, music, songwriting, and looking back at the 1970s music scene compared to now. Thank you kindly for joining us today for Your Take. Hey, James, pleased to be here. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you kindly. And the first thing I was kind of going to say before we start talking about your, your life and career was I'm a huge music fan myself and it's music's had a, a huge impact on my life. And I'd say a lot of the interviews we've done so far on your take have been very much music led talking to musicians, songwriters, producers, and so on. So I'm interested to hear your take on the music scene when you started from kind of your, your education to today. But I thought the, the obvious point would be to go back to the very beginning, if we could. Sure. I thought we'd turn the clock back to the mid-1950s to 1955. You were born May the 23rd and born and raised in Paramus, New Jersey. I just wanted to ask you to describe what it was like growing up in the Friedman household and just your memories basically from that sort of period, from like kind of the late 50s, early 60s onwards. Well, Paramus uh, is a suburb of New York City. And uh, it was, uh, a you know, just really a hop, skip, and a jump from Manhattan mm. uh, across the Hudson River. But as a suburb, it uh, enjoyed tree-lined streets. And, and in some ways, as a place to grow up, it was a very idyllic uh, location. And, uh, you know, I used to walk to school. In fact, uh, I even we had a duck, Belinda. She used to follow me to school, and that was problematic. But Oh, wow. Um, and uh, it was it had some of the the first big shopping centers in, in America, uh, uh, and uh, they broadcast a TV show from the bowling alley there. So, uh, you know, for many years I thought the whole world was just like Paramus, New Jersey, uh, this very idyllic, quiet street, tree lined uh, suburbs. It, it took me years to figure out that the whole world was not exactly like Paramus, New Jersey. Um, and I've, you know, I've been sort of adjusting ever since. Uh, I grew up, uh, um, you know, with a, a house of four kids. Uh, mm -hmm. my, my folks split when I was about five. So uh, my mom raised us uh, for the most part. There was always a lot of music in the house. There was always a Broadway show tune on the piano. Uh, and so, you know, those were a lot of my early musical influences. It was inevitable that I'd do, you know, that music was going to be a part of my life. 
but it wasn't until I started, you know, getting paid like ten bucks for, for a gig that I thought, oh, that's kind of neat. I can uh, do something I love doing anyway, and then they pay me money. You've so, uh, I've been doing it ever since. A, a nice way to start. You set the scene kind of beautifully of where you were kind of born and raised. I kind of just wanted to be more specific and kind of look into your family background, and I wanted to ask about your parents and just find out some information about them. Who were they? What were their names? What did they do for a living? And a little bit about the relationship between you and your siblings. <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, well, my uh, my mom and dad, my uh, mom, Rose Rosette uh, Friedman, was a, uh, a, a performer and singer. She performed on Broadway and and uh, in film and uh, uh, like I say she was my biggest mu musical influence growing up in that household my dad was an animator and illustrator and animator wound up also doing live action direction for TV commercials but started out doing a comic strip and uh, they uh, you know they met going to City College in New York where I wound up going when I finally uh, left high school. And uh, for the first few years of my life, things seemed pretty normal and okay. Uh, as I said, they split when I was about five. It was early on and, you know, one of those really uh, noisy divorces. And, uh, um, and uh, you know, I had a rambunctious uh, bunch of siblings uh, older sister Erica and my younger brother Aram and younger bro younger sister Russell. Um And, uh, you know, we've gone through our periods of time with squabbles, but, uh, uh, you know, over the time at this stage of the game, we're relatively close and, uh, you know, are always in touch. And, uh, um, yeah, my older sister Erica is, uh, has been a teacher uh, most of her life and uh, has authored some books. And my younger brother Aram, he's a, a, a video engineer and he's built giant planetariums and, and worked for CBS, you know, news and sports and travel all over the world doing broadcasting. And uh, my, uh, my kid sister, Russell, uh, has written for TV, and uh, these days they're we're all spread out pretty much uh, on you know I guess three corners of the continental United States. Sure. Um, and uh, everybody's hanging in there, you know, with uh, their kids and lots of cousins, and so uh, we survived <laughs> the, the, the ridiculousness of our childhood. You're, you're from obviously a very creative arts background and you mentioned about what your mum and dad did uh, for a living but I wanted to be kind of more specific and delve into your the music where did you first kind of hear music I presume it was in the household but kind of what music really turned you on and kind of when you got to a stage where you thought actually I kind of want to pursue a career in this well as i say uh, my mom was a, a, a performer and just a, a you know world-class singer and, and trained color to soprano there was always some broadway musical or uh you know uh, some classical opera on, on the piano or playing on the turntable so uh, some of my early musical influences would have been classical and and broadway show tunes uh, and you know West Side Story and Randy Bernstein and the Gershwin uh, catalog, and uh, so that was a big part of my growing up. The, those songs, and as soon as I got a transistor radio, of course, I started listening to all the top, you know, forty radio, and uh, you know the Beatles and Dylan and Supremes, uh, and uh, Stevie Wonder, and really, uh, you know, grew up loving all kinds of music uh, and uh, you know my influences have always been eclectic and that, that, that reflects in you know the, the eclecticism that you'll see in all the different genres on any of my albums and uh, so 
Uh, I, I got my first guitar when I was about nine. I, uh, I paid for it with a bag full of quarters that I earned delivering newspapers and dumped them on the, the, the uh, counter at, at Manny's Music. And I said, I'd like that guitar. Uh, learned four chords and started strumming them and uh, you know, like Monkey's tunes and Beatles tunes. And, uh, and then not too long after, started writing some of my own songs. Uh, I wrote my first song uh, when I was nine. It was, I'd love to take Swim With You in the Summertime. And uh, uh, it uh, <laughs> um, got a lot of good feedback. <laughs> and so uh, I just uh, kept writing songs, and uh, I haven't really stopped. Been doing it ever since. From buying your first guitar from Manny's Music, you kind of go on in your teenage years to play weddings and bar mitzvahs as part of a band called Marsha and the Self Portraits. I wanted to ask what are your memories of that particular band and performing live music and what kind of style of music were you playing with that with that group at the time? Uh, well, it was a cover band and Marsha was, uh, you know, an adorable singer and we you know, we just did weddings and bar mitzvahs and lounge dates and, uh, you know, gigs at the uh, American Legion Hall. And uh, we did all the top 40 tunes. And uh, again, it ran the gamut in terms of musical idioms. It was rock and pop and uh, country and folk. And and uh, it was really actually a great experience, you know, because uh, when you're in a cover band, uh, you're... Let's put it this way: When I'm doing a Dean Friedman gig, uh, there's there, e e even within the eclectic genres th that I explore in my own songwriting, there's still Dean Friedman songs. It still falls within a certain parameter. But when I, when you're doing a cover tunes in a band like that, then uh, you can be everybody. You know, one minute you're Elton John, the next minute you're Stevie Wonder, the next minute you're Dolly Parton. And it really is a great uh, learning environment to become familiar with all these different musical idioms, all the, the harmonic vocabulary that's unique and characteristic of every different genre and those different styles and idioms. And, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, the only problem is, is that a lot for the fancy gigs, I had to wear a tuxedo, but I was always forgetting my shoes. <laughs> and I'd show up in sneakers, so I'd have to stand behind my guitar amp. Uh, to not uh, look too uh, out of place. But uh, it was a fun experience, good stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a good uh, learning environment. From buying your first guitar, writing your very first songs and being in a, a covers band, it seems that the next step was obviously a musical education and you spent time at the City College of New York and you were mentored by musician David Brumberg. I wanted to ask what you learned from your time there and did it kind of give you the drive, the ambition to actually go out and pursue a career as a, as a songwriter, as a musician? Well, I, for some reason, I, I had the drive inexplicably, uh, but what I did get at uh, City College was uh, an education from a lot of really great world-class musicians uh, and uh, you know folks like John Lewis from uh, the Modern Jazz Quartet and uh, Barry Galbraith uh, one of the top studio guitarists in, in New York City at the time and uh, so uh, it was an opportunity to really learn the basics in, in terms of my craft in terms of uh, you know in terms of music theory in terms mm. of uh, getting better versed on my two instruments, guitar and piano, and uh, being exposed to a, a variety of uh, music and, and, and sort of getting uh, experience delving in, into greater depth as to how those uh, compositions uh, were put together in terms of analyzing their harmony and the melodies and the counterpoints. Uh, I uh, had my first experience with doing horn arrangements and string arrangements at City College, which served me really well when I finally 
wound up in a studio or working uh, with an orchestra and a band. And so uh, I had some great teachers, uh, so some really great experiences. And uh, I really did, in spite of myself, because <laughs> I wasn't the most diligent student, but I, I got a great education there. And uh, when I did get the opportunity to go further and, and start making records and, and recording, it really did serve me well. Do you think it was kind of um, a good time to kind of study your music? Obviously, you're looking at a, a key period in, in music where artists were selling lots and lots of records at the time and also being located in New York, obviously a, a major capital in the world, obviously a big place in terms of the, the recording industry. Do you think it was a good time and a, a good place to be kind of, you know, doing what you were doing at that period? Well, you know, <laughs> there's, there's never a bad time to do music. Uh, and certainly the industry changes uh, dramatically from one era to the next. Mm. But, uh, you know, there's some aspects of music that are really timeless. And uh, that's independent of styles and genres and, and trends. And, you know, good melody is always a good melody. Uh, you know, a, a beautiful harmonic progression is always a, a beautiful harmonic progression. And the same for, uh, you know, a swing and rhythmic figure. And uh, I, I would say that for me, in terms of my ambition and desire to, to pursue that music, uh, that I did grow up in an era of singer-songwriters. Uh, and that made a big impact on me. And in particular, those singer-songwriters, you know, from the period of, you know, Dylan through the 70s, where folks like Joni Mitchell and, and James Taylor and Elton John and Bernie Taupin came to the fore. Uh, you know, when it, when I was really little, uh, you know, kids wanted to grow up to be an astronaut or a cowboy. But as I was coming of age, what you did want to grow up, what, you, what a lot of kids aspired to be was, was a, a rock star, or in my case, a singer-songwriter. And so, uh, you know, those were some of the idols and heroes of the day. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I wasn't sure how I'd do in space as an astronaut, but uh, it seemed that I had the tools to, to, to pursue what I loved, uh, which was the music. And I started writing songs early on and, and, and got a lot of really positive feedback from all around me and uh, kept pursuing it. I started sending out demos from the time I was 15 and had a wall full of rejection letters from every major label in the United States. And for some reason, they just motivated me even more. Uh, and uh, it was uh, when I took a, a, a class with... Uh, David Bromberg, who was uh, uh, doing a, a guest lecture at City College. And uh, he's considered in the States as the godfather of Americana. A uh, great you know, instrumentalist, guitar player, songwriter, performer. Uh, and uh, I was really familiar with his work. And he was a big influence musically in, in that regard. Uh, and uh, meeting him... Being in his class, I had an opportunity to, to play some of my songs for him. And I just kept really just nudging him until he finally relented and introduced me to uh, the folks who became my first managers in the music business, the, the, the guys that ran the Bottom Line nightclub in New York City, mm -hmm. which at the time was the premier showcase for uh, recording artists, uh, you know, uh, breaking out. Uh, in, in the New York scene. Uh, they became my early managers and got me my first record deal uh, with a small independent label. But more than that, they uh, it really, uh, because they ran one of the hottest nightclubs in New York City, uh, it, was, uh, it was really one of the best universities for an up-and-coming uh, singer-songwriter, recording artist. Uh, because I would go down there and take the, the train from the Bronx, where I was living at the time, uh, to the village, the east, you know, on West 4th Street in, in Greenwich Village, uh, where the Bottom Line uh, Club was. Uh, and night after night, I would see folks like, um, 
you know, uh, Bruce Springsteen uh, right. or uh, uh, Janice Ian or Laura Nero or Dolly Parton or, um, uh, you know, just uh, some of the top uh, artists of the day coming sure. through uh, and getting to see what they did up close and personal and, and, and being able to experience and uh, be exposed to not just their music, but their uh, their persona and their approach to music in, in, in a live venue, uh, which uh, was really really compelling. Yeah, that um, must that must have been a tremendous education as well. Some of the the names you mentioned, seeing them perform live on stage. Oh, absolutely! Patty Smith of Talking Heads. Uh, I, really, everyone went through there, and I was able to uh, you know to to, to be up close. At taking it all in and I want, uh, it, was a, it was a it was a great learning experience as important as city college was from talking about the demos you produced and recorded the rejections and you spoke about your first contract i wanted to talk about that record contract because you signed with cashman and west uh life song label um can you recall the the terms of the contract at the time and I wanted to ask you about your, your first manager. Did you have a good relationship with your initial manager? And, you know, was it, was it a good contract when you look back in, in retrospect? I don't think there is such a thing as a good record contract. <laughs> By definition, they, to this day, are abusive uh, to the artists. Uh, right. Artists are, are uh continue to be taking increasingly advantage of in the music industry. It's just the way it is. It's, it's fucked up. It's always been that way. It has not changed. In fact, it's, it's gotten significantly worse, mm -hmm. worse with the advent of streaming. Um, and, uh, you know, I could spend the next hour just on a rant about how abusive streaming is to, to artists. Uh, but, uh, just, uh, take it, <laughs> uh, just you know, at the face value, that uh, it's a system that it, it's a, the record industry is an industry that eats its young, um, and uh, it, there's not not much has changed. It's just there are more people uh, that are taking their a new bite of the pie. Mm. Uh, but so, in answer to your question, uh, the sign the record contract I signed with Life Song Records was particularly odious even compared to some of the most uh, abusive record contracts of the day. Um, and it was a small indie label, but the, the owner of the label was a, a really obnoxious attorney. Uh, and he used that knowledge to take advantage of everybody uh, in the business, not just the artists, the people that work for the company as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, my managers were a pair, uh, Alan Pepper and Stanley Stadowski, who ran the nightclub together as a pair. And, uh, you know, I'll uh, give them credit for, for getting me, bringing me, introducing me to Life Song Records, the first label they took me to, which offered me a deal, um, and uh, getting me into the game. But they, again, took uh, terrible advantage uh, of me as the artist. Uh, they, because they were nightclub owners uh, with a big staff and a very successful nightclub, uh, they... Uh, never really could grapple with the, the, the definition of management uh, and their role with, to the artist. They still, because everyone in their lives was an employee, mm. they thought I worked for them. Uh, and I really never viewed the relationship between a manager and an artist as one where they employed me. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, it ruptured because of that attitude of theirs. That they thought I worked for them, uh, and I just didn't see it that way. So when they wanted to fire my guitar player for, for the crime of, uh, of wanting to retain a, a TV payment for being on air on a, a TV show in the states, uh, I said, "No, I'm not going to fire him because what he's asking is entirely fair." Um, they took they had, they threw a hissy fit and, and decided no longer to manage me. Uh, I, again, I don't want to belabor the point. But it's just, it was a typical scenario. Uh, they, uh, they, you know, they, 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 in spite of the fact that I was writing hit records, delivering chart records one after the other, uh, album after album, 
Uh, they just didn't seem, uh, they didn't see fit to treating me in any kind of equity or, or mm. fairness. And uh, so at some point I realized I got to get out of the situation and eventually I did. I want to move on to the, the point of the interview where it's the kind of question you've probably been asked hundreds and hundreds of times before, but it's obviously such a major breakthrough in your career. And that was the single released in 1977, Ariel, which was a, a huge US hit on the Billboard chart. It's a song about a, a free-spirited, pot-smoking, vegetarian Jewish girl from Paramus, New Jersey. But what made you write the song? Is it about a real life person? And what was your reaction to the popularity and the success of, uh, of the song? Well, uh, it was the last song that I'd written on the first album. And uh, there's something that, uh, about it that I knew was gonna be appealing, but I was a little self-conscious uh, of the storyline because nothing much really happens. The guy goes out and meets a girl, go, they go out on a date, they wind up back watching t TV and making out uh, uh, in the living room after a bowl of spaghetti. And so I thought, well, there's not much of a plot here. Uh, and I was concerned until I played the record for uh, two teenage girls who lived on my block. And after listening to uh, uh, the, the single, they accused me of reading their diaries, at which point I realized that I had probably struck the right chord. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it was a hit right out of the box. In fact, uh, when it was first released uh, on WNEW FM in New York, which was the time of the number one FM station in America, uh, we got a call uh, from the, the program director at the station saying, please, at the, state, at the record label, they, say, they said, please tell Dean to stop telling his friends to call the request line because it's being inundated with his friends calling the request line. And I, I laughed, I said, that's ridiculous because my friends are not doing that. that. That's just people calling, and they finally dawned on them that they had a natural hit uh, and it started racing up the charts. The, the, the one frustration is that because it was a small independent label that really didn't have a clue, they were unable to keep up with the demand for the record. As a result, uh, they would constantly run out of stock. So the, the, the record would shoot up the charts with a bullet. Um, then they'd run out of stock and it would drop it down again. They'd get new stock and then it would shoot up again. It must have bounced up, up and down the charts into the top 20 uh, at least four or five times. It was on the charts for months for that reason because they couldn't fulfill the stock and the demand at the time. Mm. Uh, and so that was a frustration. And it was the beginning of uh, my understanding that the people that I was working with, uh, you know, they had some uh, positive uh, qualities in terms of access to the industry, but ultimately they were idiots and uh, were not getting the job done. Uh, so, uh, but he hearing the record uh, and having it be a single was uh, really exciting, it was, it was very satisfying. But bear in mind, I'd been sending out demos since I was 15. Uh, and so this was about six years later. Uh, so even though it seemed like an overnight uh, hit, you know, success story, uh, by the time I had a chart record in the United States, for me, it was kind of like I'd been waiting for a really long time. And it was like, OK, well, it took long enough. It's about time. <clears throat> let's, let's, do, let's go on and continue this uh, saga. From that overdue chart single then literally kind of a year on you have another hit but this side of the pond and on this occasion a, a duet called lucky stars which was a a top three hit here in the uk in 1978 i wanted to ask what the song's about and what made you decide to write a duet and team up with uh, singer denise Marsa. and also i also wanted to ask you your recollections of coming to britain in the late 1970s to perform the single and perform it on, you know, some of the popular music shows at the time, in particular, Top of the Pops, which was a, a huge show in, uh, in Britain at the time. Well, uh, the, the song was written uh, around a period of time where, you know, even after I signed a record deal, 
um, I was still, you know, driving a taxi cab to pay the rent. And uh, so I was listening to a lot of country music uh, on the radio, driving the taxi cab. And uh, at the time, there were not a, a lot of duets in pop music. Uh, but uh, 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 in, in country music, there's always been a long tradition to duets. And so in some ways, Lucky Stars was my sort of pop version of a, a traditional country duet, which is filled with, you know, romance and squabbles and marital strife and uh, jealousy rearing its, its head. And, and all those elements were, were part of the story in Lucky Stars. Uh, I would also have to say that it also, I mean, people have suggested that it's like a mini Broadway musical because it does have that sort of narrative quality and dialogue. Uh, in the conversation in the duet. It's sort of a little mini scene. So all of those influences came to play. I met Denise uh, through Don Palouse, who engineered my first album uh, at CBS Studios in New York. And uh, when she opened her mouth to sing, even though she's not very tall, her voice just filled the room. And so after writing Lucky Stars, I thought, well, I bet she can do a, a, a nice job on this track, and indeed she did. Uh, now, when uh, we recorded it, uh, the label again, uh, were uh, not, you know, they were questioning why I would put a, a duet on an album of this solo singer songwriter. And I had to assure them that it was, a, you know, a good song people would enjoy it and it was worth keeping. Um, they didn't really want it on the album. Uh, and in fact, uh, when I delivered the album, uh, Well, I Said the Rocking Chair, uh, they uh, chastised me for a, a good half hour. They took me into the, they called me in for a meeting. They berated me. They said, you, it's, you delivered a terrible album. <laughs> it's, it's not as good as your first album. Uh, you didn't listen to anybody. You're a bad, spoiled artist. Uh, and I was just kind of scratching my head hearing this because I knew it was a really good record that I just made. Uh, they were unhappy because I had been touring with my band and incorporating those musical elements in, in, into the production on the second album. They came from a more acoustic, folk-oriented country world, and uh, that's what they wanted to hear. So they're very, very disappointed with the album. Uh, they were really upset with me. Uh, and uh, I walked out of that meeting, uh, simply con confirmed what I'd always known to be the case, which is that they were fucking idiots. And... Uh, that was uh, proven uh, about a week later when we got a telex uh, from the UK, and, and again, this is before faxes, before the internet, saying that uh, Lucky Stars had entered the charts, was racing up the charts. Uh, and they couldn't understand it. They were perplexed. And, uh, uh, you know, again, it just, you know, proved <laughs> them so off base in terms of trying to uh, understanding what it is what I, that I was trying to do. Uh, and uh, so fortunately, you know, Lucky Stars uh, sort of gave me a lifeline uh, to continue doing what I do. Um, and uh, if only <laughs> they'd been able to release one other single other than that. But uh, that's the case. I, I love the, the song and I've always been proud of the record. But it was sort of a double-edged sword in terms of how admittedly corny the story was. Um, and a, a lot of people, I think, t didn't really sort of get the tongue-in-cheek aspect of it. Uh, although at the same time, it was telling a, a really true story, a, a story familiar to any couple uh, who's had to deal with those kinds of issues and seeing the necks and you know that element of jealousy. And... Uh, it was a story that was truthful, uh, you know, for all the dumb glum rhymes in it. And I, I think that's what people related to the most. And I think that's what why people <laughs> to this day ha have embraced the song and that album. Uh, and they still let me back in the country. We've spoken about your, your two big hits in quite some detail. And I kind of want to move on and talk about songwriting because... Your lyrics, the, the words you write, are, they're so clever, they're funny, 
they're very original and they're kind of hard to categorize but I kind of wanted to ask you how important are song lyrics and how do you go about composing new material and are you a songwriter who likes to tell stories tell a narrative and write about observations and experiences and people you've met in your life well uh, well what you just said I I, I would say I, I've really always viewed myself as uh, someone who writes short stories set to music and uh, so there is generally is some kind of narrative uh, to what's going on um, I, I, I grew up most admiring those songwriters uh, who managed to paint very vivid pictures with their words and music mm. uh, on almost of a cinematic quality and so I'm, I'm thinking about people like Joni Mitchell Paul Simon, Randy Newman, uh, Bernie Taupin, and Elton John, uh, because when you when I would listen to those songs, it really transport me to another place. Uh, I, I would find myself inside the song, and so starting out, that's something I was aspired to do as a songwriter myself, and still to this day, that's my ambition, uh, because to my mind, uh, to to write a song that that engages the listener in that way uh, is a way of inviting them into the song to make them part of the song uh, and so that they become co-conspirators <laughs> and you know whatever detail I leave out uh, the listener is going to uh, fill in with their own experience and their imagination uh, and so it, it, it almost makes it a collaborative effort mm -hmm. uh, and uh, if I accomplish that then I've exceeded succeeded in, in, in the goal I set out uh, uh, to, to hit, which, which is the, to, you know, bring the listener into the song. As we talk about songwriting and the creative process, obviously you've written so many songs that have become familiar to us and been regularly played on radio, featured in film, TV and advertising as well. But we've obviously mentioned the, the two big hits but other songs like Rockin' Chair, McDonald's Girl, uh, and Women of Mine, do you have any favourites? Which ones do you enjoy performing the most? And which of your songs do you think are best received by your fans and followers? Well, you know what? Look, I think most songwriters will tell you that songs are like little kids. You love them all. It's just some are better behaved than others. So, for example, McDonald's Girl, which I always loved from the beginning, and I knew to be a pure pop song. Uh, you know, uh, I, I just, uh, you know, there was no escaping it uh, from the moment I finished writing it. Um, and when it was uh, released uh, at the time by uh, CBS slash Epic, uh, it was banned by the BBC officially for m mentioning a commercial trade name, McDonald's. Um, so that was a huge frustration. But uh, the song persisted. It insisted on being heard. And it was just a, a few years later that then unknown band out of Canada called Bare Naked Ladies did a cover version of it, uh, which was their first airplay hit in, in, in Canada. Uh, the band called The Blenders had a number one with it in Norway. And then YouTube came along and went viral. All over the world, there are people doing their own versions of McDonald's Girl or acting out cover versions of McDonald's Girl. Uh, again, the song just insisted on being heard. Uh, and uh, that, that was always really satisfying and, and gratifying. Uh, and it only took about 33 years for finally the McDonald's Corporation to call me up and say, uh, we'd like to license your song for a national TV and radio campaign. And I said, well, that's great. What took you so fucking long? <laughs> uh, and, uh, but again, it confirmed what I had believed from the start, which was that it was a pure pop song. Uh, and... Uh, infectious and had all those elements that uh, you know made people listen and, and their ears perk up and smile. Uh, so uh, even though I had to wait a few decades uh, to be uh, proven right uh, in my judgment, uh, it uh, it was worthwhile. And again, songs like kids, you love them all. It's just some give you a little more aggra aggravation than others.
I'm going to kind of repeat the the same ground a bit here because you've already kind of cited some of your favourite songwriters and kind of people that have inspired you from your kind of early years. And you've also mentioned about, like, for you, the best songwriters have been almost like short storytellers or, you know, you, straight away you can paint images from those kind of words and lyrics. But if you had to cite the songwriters that have given you the most pleasure to listen to and have inspired your own work, who would you choose? And I was going to kind of put you on the spot a bit here. Which five songs do you wish you had written and why? Well, the songwriters I mentioned are, are some of my biggest early influences. But uh, again, my influences run the gamut uh, and are super eclectic. Um, uh, you know, from, you know, Leonard Bernstein to the Monkees and uh, everyone in between. Uh, uh, I would say at those very formative years, uh, you know, right before the first album, uh, folks like Joni Mitchell and Paul Simon and James Taylor, Bernie Taubman and Elton John uh, were using a vocabulary that was familiar to me, but also uh, really transcendent in terms of the poetry, in particular Joni Mitchell, uh, who infused so much of her music and her songs with poetry perfectly wedded to the music. Mm. Uh, and uh, eventually uh, infused sort of a, a, a jazz folk fusion idiom of her own that I really related to because I, I my, my early music theory training was all in jazz, so a, a really solid jazz background, uh, which to me, I fuse uh, with the pop I grew up listening to as well. So I related to that kind of uh, mix of genres. Um, uh, Randy Newman, in terms of his comedic aspects and uh, also in terms of his deadly satire, uh, you know, not just the comedy, but the way he uh, would capture, you know, reality uh, with just deft poetry. And so I, I tried to, to use language in that way, um, but also in a way that uh, was within a familiar vernacular. Uh, and at the same time, trying to wed it to, to music that was compelling and interesting with good harmonic changes and and so those were some of my early influences, uh, but it really it does really run the gamut. Um, you know, I would throw Brian Wilson in there you know, in terms of mm. his beautiful compositions and uh, just melodies and harmonic vocabulary. Uh, you know, if you're talking about five songs, that's a tough one. Yeah, uh, I imagine it is. One that pops to mind yeah. is, is Brandy, and that's just a great pop record. It's one of my favorite records. I, I can't explain exactly why, uh, other than refer to what I said earlier, which is that that's a song that transports the listener. You can't listen to that song, uh, you know, without imagining this port uh, and, you know, this sailor who's, uh, uh, you know, off on his adventures and just stops in and, and this, uh, uh, you know, this, it's a scenario, it's a scene that's totally plausible, but not necessarily familiar, but uh, just transportive to the listener. Um, uh, talking about Joni Mitchell, one of my first songs of hers that I became familiar with Michael from Mountains, uh, but it was the Judy Collins cover of it, uh, which was just sublime and, and beautifully sung and performed and uh, just such a lovely song. And again, uh, painting pictures w with words and music uh, where you just couldn't help but imagine what was being sung about even if you didn't necessarily understand all of what it was about, the imagery and the, um, just the, uh, the, the poetry uh, wedded to the, those beautiful melodies and progressions mm. uh, were just uh, hypnotic. Um, uh, I mentioned Randy Newman. One of the first songs of his that I became familiar with was Political Science, which just slayed me. Uh, you know, great 
um, you know, uh, New Orleans influenced uh, Americana song uh, depicting America's <laughs> role as, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the de facto uh, leader uh, of the world uh, at that time uh, and expressing frustration with the lack of respect people showed us thinking, well, you know, let's just drop the bomb. <laughs> let's just blow everybody up. You know, screw it. Um, but written just, you know, with such a funny take on on current events and, and such really funny humor and satire that you couldn't help but love it. Um, uh, Simon and Garfunkel, uh, you know, Paul Simon uh, and... Mm. Uh, the song America, again, a song that you listen to and it transports you. You you, wind, you find yourself on a bus, uh, touring America and looking out the window and just seeing the country uh, pass you by. Uh, and uh, you know, a teenager growing up, being exposed to that music for the first time, uh, that widens your horizon. That gives you a new perspective. That broadens your perspective, and uh, that's a world that you want to learn more about. Mm. Uh, and those are the songs that do that. I mentioned Brian Wilson, uh, "God Only Knows." Again, just just beautiful. Uh, I think Tony Asher uh, probably aided with the lyrics there. Um, poetic lyrics wedded to just uh, a sublime melody uh, and harmonic uh, setting that uh, you, you can't not love. And uh, so, uh, yeah, those are the kind of songwriters that impacted me the most. But I also, you know, love pure jazz, classical jazz, jazz fusion, um, you know, Weather Report, John McLaughlin, and uh, um, just... Uh, Anyone, I, I just really, really just listen to. I love all kinds of music, uh, and whenever I have the occasion to, when I'm not doing tedious, tedious like nonsense office stuff, uh, that's what I try to immerse myself in. I wanted to um, talk about composing for television and film projects, which is something else you've done. Um, of the film and television projects you've worked on, do you have any favourites and why? And I also wanted to ask how that process differs, for example, to, you know, producing and writing songs for for an album. Well, the projects I've worked on have always been a lot of fun. Uh, I've been fortunate to be able to work with, you know, good folks and, and on shows that uh, allow me to to play and explore and have fun with, with the music and, and, and setting it uh, to serve the, 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 the film or the video. Mm. And that's the big difference right there is that um, when I'm, uh, you know, sitting down to prepare and write a Dean Friedman album, uh, it can be daunting because I really I'm looking at a blank page, uh, and my source material is the world around me, <laughs> and my life, and the lives of my friends and family, and uh, uh, so that's all well and good, but it can be a little daunting because uh, it's a big universe, it's a, it's a big world and a big life uh, to choose from, uh, so to focus uh, becomes a challenge. Uh, doing soundtrack for TV or film is quite the opposite because you're there to serve. Uh, the vision of uh, the storyteller, the director, and, and and to serve the film itself, the the visuals, uh, to supplement them and enhance them, and support them, uh, and so uh, in some respects, although it does sort of give you strict parameters and limitations within which to work, it also is liberating because you're no longer looking over blank page, you have a specific goal and a target, and uh, you know, when I do songwriting workshops, and, and one of the points I always make is that the sooner you have a goal, the sooner you know what your song is going to be about or, or what you want it to be, the better off that you are because then you can strategize how to achieve that goal, how to get there, what steps you need to take to get to, 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 to reach that destination. 
And so to do soundtracks for TV and film, uh, that's built into the process because uh, it may be a chase scene. And so that'll give me some sense of what direction to go. It may be a romantic scene. Mm -hmm. It may be um, uh, trying to develop a character to, to, to create a, a feel for the nature of that character uh, or the relationship between two characters. Uh, and so once you have that kind of a brief, uh, as I say, it's liberating because uh, you can just sort of dispense, dispense with infinity and, and, and hone in on the job, the task at hand. And uh, so I've always found it to be great fun. It's always a little daunting at first, you know, just uh, sort of gearing up for the creative process or any creative process. Uh, but uh, I I've always really ultimately enjoyed uh, th that kind of work and the results. There was there was one film in particular that I wanted to briefly pick up on, and I had to go out and buy the Blu-ray of it the other day because I kind of remember it well as a, a cult film, a British horror film. But I kind of wanted to ask you, how on earth did you get involved in composing, performing, and producing the soundtrack for? kind of a B British cult horror, which was released back in 1990, called I Bought a Vampire Motorcycle. I wanted to ask what it was like working on the, the film soundtrack and the, the song you produced, which was She Runs on Blood, Not Gasoline. And I kind of wanted to ask, what was your reaction to the, um, the finished film when you saw it? Well, at the end of the day, it was great fun. It, 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 was, it was a blast. Uh, and the folks that I worked with on it, it was a great bunch of people who uh, all were part of the uh, the the, uh, the performers and, and production crew for the TV series Boone. Uh, Neil Morrissey, Michael Elphick, um, and all the folks uh, that were involved on that series, which I worked on for about five seasons. Mm. Um, uh, were involved in the film. And uh, Michael Miller, who was a uh, video engineer on Boone, on the TV series, uh, and utilized all my soundtrack work as he was editing. Uh, uh, when I was there working on Boone uh, during one of my visits, uh, he, he handed me a script. He said, Dean, uh, we're, we're trying to raise money to do this low-budget horror film, and uh, would you be interested in doing the soundtrack for it? And I said, sure, let me read it. And, of course, when I read it, I thought to myself, they're never going to get this made. No one's going to get the money to make this ridiculous film about a, a vampire motorcycle that goes around killing people. And and lo and behold, they did. And so uh, they brought me in to do the soundtrack. And uh, as I say, it was great working with them. They're really good folks. Um, it was a hilarious property. I mean, really ridiculous. Uh, but that was uh, uh, so much of the fun of working for it. Um, you know, how do you score uh, 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 the soundtrack for a, a, a motorcycle that becomes possessed by the devil? Now, what kind of music is, is is appropriate for that motorcycle slicing a nurse in half? Uh, or uh, when uh, there's a flashback or uh, a dream sequence where one of the protagonists is talking to the, uh, a, 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 an animated talking turd. Uh, how do you orchestrate that scene uh, to, to best serve the film? Uh, those were the challenges that I faced uh, working on I Bought a Fire Motorcycle. And let me tell you, it really has become a cinema classic, a cult horror film classic, uh, and... Uh, um, uh, I it warms my heart every time it airs on Sky yeah. TV, uh, and uh, I, I uh, yeah I it's I, I uh, I'm I, I'm always been proud of my involvement in that great production, and I still have high hopes for uh, the sequel. Uh, I bought another vampire motorcycle part two, uh, so you never know. Yeah, if enough of your listeners uh, support that effort, uh, they may raise the money again, and I'll be there ready to do the soundtrack. Oh, so they're doing um, some sort of Kickstarter or Indiegogo 
film campaign uh, are they or well they're working on a script they're starting to talk about it it's early days but you never know okay we we kind of move back to songwriting again from cult films cult horror films back to the the songs and your songs have been again covered by many bands and artists if i just name a few the the bare naked ladies the ben folds five the blenders many many more do you have any favorite covers and if so why uh, well, I, I love all the covers. Uh, it's always, a, uh, it really is, I get a real kick out of hearing someone else's interpretation of one of my mm. songs. Uh, and no matter how uh, different it is, it's still a delight. And uh, like when I first heard Bare Naked Ladies uh, do their version of McDonald's Girl, um, uh, I, it was so drastically different than sort of the, the pop I- idiom that I'd composed it in uh the it, it was a bit jarring just for a second but then i just totally fell in love with it and uh so that's always a treat i, I will make one brief c- correction in terms of ben folds five is that ben folds uh, never covered any of my tunes uh but they do have a song called kate uh it's a great song mm. uh that many people have pointed out to me uh sounds curiously uh, familiar in terms of relaying a story uh, almost verse for verse uh, that is uh, depicted in my first hit, Ariel. Um, uh, You know, she's described by the music that she plays and performs. Uh, She happens to smoke pot just like Ariel. Uh, She, um, uh, she, instead of... uh, working for the friends of BEI collecting quarters, uh, she's handing out the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, there are a lot of very close similarities to the lyrics. Now, I, I had a friend ask Ben Folds whether he was influenced by the song Ariel, and he denied it. Uh, but I then found out that he co-wrote the song with his ex-wife, uh, who I suspect wrote the lyrics to it. So for what it's worth, I just want to go on record saying that even though I know it, it's quoted in some papers and, and, mm. and whatnot and, and, and uh, on Wikipedia, um, uh, I, I would suspect that that song was influenced very much by Ariel, but they never did a cover version of it. But, you know, uh, imitation is, a, is a, a form of flattery. So uh, um, I, uh, uh, and by the way, Kate is a great song in and of itself, it stands on its own. It doesn't need to be influenced by anything. I want to ask you one final question before we move on to the quick fire questions that we all that we ask or uh, your take guess, which are the final 13 quick questions. And my last question is, how do you look back at the music industry today compared to when you were at the height of your success in the late 1970s and how difficult you've kind of alluded to this already, but How difficult is it to make a living from music in today's climate? And for you today, what brings in the most revenue as a musician? Well, in some ways it's easier, in some ways it's harder. Mm. Um, In terms of being a musician, in particular being a recording artist and a performing recording artist, uh, the democratization of, of the, the tools of recording have made it possible for many, many more people uh, to actually record an album. When I started uh, recording my first album uh, in the late 70s, you needed at least $2 million to, to open up a, a proper professional recording studio. Uh, you know, talking about two-inch reels, 16-track decks, and... Uh, uh, it was a, a huge uh, financial investment. Uh, so not every kid on the corner could uh, have a studio recording st- a recording studio in their basement uh, in those days, but that's no longer the case. Now, now because of the technology has evolved and the tools have become so accessible, uh, you know, for a thousand bucks with a laptop and one good mic, an interface uh, and free software from BandLab, uh, you can you have the tools uh, that are, are are powerful enough to produce a 
top quality, world class studio produced uh, production um, in your bedroom or <laughs> your closet or wherever you can uh, set up to make a record. Uh, also, by virtue of the internet, distribution uh, of music digital content is affordable to everybody and accessible to everybody. Um, and so those things didn't exist when I started out. You needed a, a, a whole a fleet of trucks to, after you manufactured your vinyl, to ship it out all over the place. Um, that's no longer an issue. But uh, what is still an issue is that uh, the gatekeepers of mainstream media mm. uh, still really control uh, most of what you hear. Not all of it, because the internet has made anecdotal uh, access to an audience possible uh, in ways that were, were never possible before. Uh, but uh, the, the big difference is that in terms of uh, compensation and revenue stream, in terms of how a musician gets paid for their songs and their recordings of those songs, um, uh, the primary modes of listening, uh, which are streaming, uh, continue to be abusive to uh, the creative artists who uh, create the content that these big billion dollar companies are built on. Uh, when people like, when companies like Spotify and Apple Music and Amazon and YouTube and Deezer uh, are paying, uh, sometimes a thousandth of a penny per stream. Uh, it really is impossible for all but a very handful of artists to make a living uh, by streaming alone. Uh, and thus forcing artists to do it, they've always been forced to do, which is go on the road uh, and make their revenue performing live. Uh, and again, you know, that's why so many artists starting out in the early days of the recording industry were killed in plane crashes and car crashes because they had to constantly be touring in order to make a living. Because uh, even if they had hits, multiple hits, record companies uh, would not pay them anything close to an equitable uh, fair share of the revenue taken in. Uh, and the same is not only true today, but it is even worse uh, because of, of the streaming uh, has become so dominant the means by which people uh, enjoy music uh, they should be reminded that unless you're buying music direct from your artists from their websites unless you support those artists directly uh, basically the streaming companies are stealing their lunch uh, and if all you do is stream music then you're you're uh, complicit in, in the theft uh, of your favorite artists so stream all you want. Uh, I stream as well. But but if you care about independent music and you, you care about uh, supporting those artists that uh, you enjoy listening to, uh, buy direct. Uh, that's my message to your listeners. And uh, it bears repeating every time you do a podcast. Dean Friedman, with that message and that last note, we move on to the last 13 quickfire questions. And we okay. do this with all your take gas. So don't think about these too long. These are quick fire questions just to find out things you like, things you hate, and kind of just find out a little bit about you outside of music. So here we go. Number one, what would you say is your favorite pastime? Well, uh, mm. you know, outside of uh, binging uh, on Netflix, uh, my favorite pastime would be... Um, I, you know, I, I really uh, have always had an affinity for animation. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not a great animator, but I, I've done a, a fair share of it uh, over the years. And uh, every time I do it, it it's, it's fun. It's, I learn something new. Uh, so, you know, for me, that's uh, a, a, a great way to while away many hours and many days of time if I can get away with it. And, of course, a, a family connection as well with animation sure. and we we spoke um off mic before the the interview started about 
Aardman animation and, and so on as well. We've, we've spoken about film as well a little bit in the interview, but I want to ask what your favourite film is and why. Well, two come to mind. One is Robin and Marion. Uh, and uh, with uh, Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn. And I, I'm not sure exactly why, uh, except that it was such an unlikely story. Uh, you know, it was the story of Robin and Marion, but in, in, in not in their heyday. You know, after all the adventures, uh, when he had left her and come back from finally from the Crusades, and uh, and they were, you know, it was in their uh, elder uh, era, um, but there was just a, 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 a such a sweetness to it, and uh, they just played such great characters. It was a great storyline. It was uh, sort of like superheroes in the real world, what they, what they actually are like. Uh, and so it sort of, it was demythalized, uh, that whole story of, of Robin Hood and Marion. And anyway, it was just a great film. Uh, and uh, whenever it, it, uh, I get a chance to see it, I just, something about it just always strikes me. The other one would be How to Train Your Dragon, which is just a brilliant animation. And I, I can still remember the first time I saw it, uh, the, 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 the sheer awesomeness with which they depicted what it would be like to fly on your own dragon. Uh, and it was just, uh, you know, uh, astonishing. And, and such a beautiful uh, use and realization of the magic of animation, uh, doing something that you can't necessarily do otherwise. From the screen to the page now, and we've spoken about writing and how much you enjoy writing lyrics play a, a major part in what you do but who would you say is your favorite novelist well you know it's funny in terms of novels uh the truth is is most of what i read are airport novels uh and 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 given that i have to say jean le Carre, uh is my favorite in terms of the stories that he that he tells and the way he writes them and the subtlety w with which he uh, paints those pictures of you know these spies and and there's always some uh you know human drama you know it's not very little shoot 'em up in a jean le car uh novel um and so uh, it's, it's very human stories, even as people are betraying their countries <laughs> and betraying their their their, their partners. Um, they're uh, there's they're almost small human stories uh, told with subtlety and and grace, uh, and the fact that it's also uh, a thriller as well is for me. Just an added bonus. I've always just enjoyed them. So that's what I read. <laughs> if you could have had a, a different profession, what would it have been? Uh, I would have to say filmmaker, because uh, although the focus of all that I do is primarily music, uh, there's always some visual component to it. And on those occasions that I've been afforded the opportunity to, I've had great fun doing music videos. Uh, and, and uh, you know, creating video content for that. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a medium that I, I still aspire to delve into further and learn more about and uh, experiment with and explore more. Uh, and uh, so that's sort of an ongoing ambition. And I had a question, any filmmakers you're particularly fascinated by their work? Well, uh, gee, I, I, I mean, there are a lot of them. I, I, I don't necessarily know all the director's names offhand, mm. uh, just my experience of the films. I, I would say just in terms of the small screen, uh, most recently I've been watching Derek by uh, Ricky Gervais, 
uh, and I think it's one of the greatest things on uh, that you can stream on TV. Um, in terms of the verisimilitude of the world he creates and acts in, and the characters that he writes and directs for, um, and the experience of watching those shows, uh, and and that small world is always so enlightening mm. and uh, so sort of life affirming uh, that uh, I have great respect for someone that can tell a story in that way uh, with in such a naturalistic form mm. uh, but to package it up into a TV series that's quite an accomplishment who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? Oh, James, that's a really tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, it's a tough, it's a tough one. Uh, you know, when, when your parents split when you're little and you grow up without a dad, you look around the world and you sort of find fathers everywhere you look. Mm. And, and that really runs the gamut uh, from, you know, folks like uh, Paul McCartney or, or Dylan or my mom's gangster boyfriend. Uh, he, 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 those become sort of role models for what you can do in life and yeah. how you live your life. Um, but it's not just one person or individual. It's it really just a, sort of a an amalgam yeah, many. of sort of, at least in my experience, you know, all these fathers I never had. Um, and, uh, you know, try, trying to find a role model for what do I do next? Uh, because uh, in lieu of that, you sort of are trying to invent a life from scratch. And uh, so, uh, and that could be a recipe for disaster, but it also can lead to a lot of original sort of independent, uh, you know, results. Do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Uh, well, I subscribe uh, diligently to the New York Times uh, and all the news that fits that's fit to print. <laughs> and... Um, but uh, you know, even the Times, I approach with a measure, a good measure of skepticism. I try to be aware of all the 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 fractured perspectives that uh, are the other side of the aisle is mm. uh, trying to foist <laughs> on us, um, and you yeah, take it all with a grain of salt. What would you say is your favorite food? Favorite food. What do you like to eat? I like to eat. Well, my wife, Allison, complains that I like to eat mushy things, <laughs> like stews and uh, pot pies. And so uh, I guess maybe it's out of laziness or maybe just because uh, <laughs> I just like everything all together mixed up in a single bite. Tricky one, this next one. This A couple of people have kind of slipped up on this one and said, not sure. Who would you say is your favorite cultural icon? Well, uh, I don't know if he's a cult he qualifies as a cultural icon, but I I, I would say Mel Brooks, because <laughs> the life he's li lived and uh, the the art he's produced uh, is continually a delight. Just cracks me up, uh, and so uh, you know, and again back to inspiration and role models, he, he I'd have to include him as one. Curse words next. What would you say is your favorite curse word and why? Oh, fuckity fuck fuck. <laughs> Not just fuck. <laughs> fuckity fuck it's fuck. It's got to be three of them. Um, what would you say is your favorite place or holiday destination? Oh, I'm oh, sorry about that. Uh, uh, I know you're not going to edit this, but that was actually a, a spam call because we have a spam uh, ah. detector. Uh, if it rings just once, then it was bullshit. Some uh, uh, someone trying to sell me uh, some kind of some warranty tosh. for my car, which I don't it doesn't exist. Uh, favorite place? 
it would be the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, Edinburgh Fringe Festival, uh, in August, which unfortunately I had to miss last uh, season, but I'm determined to uh, be part of this August, uh, and I've, uh, I've I've booked a run at uh, uh, August 17th through the 21st at St Andrews and St George uh, West, the the church there on George Street, uh, great venue. I love the Fringe. It's a great place to be in August, not just because the weather is nicer than here in the this, this, the, the sweltering, muggy northeast, uh, but because it is a hotbed of talent and people taking creative chances and uh, all these great performers descend on the city. It's hugely inspiring. Uh, and uh, so this will be probably my 18th or 19th Fringe since I started out and looking forward to it. I hate to ask you this next one because you've mentioned so many musical influences and we've cited so many people within the last hour, but who would you say is your favourite music artist and what's your favourite album? It's impossible well, to say, isn't it? It is impossible to say, but <clears throat> for the sake of answering your question, uh, I guess I'll have to uh, go back to Joni Mitchell. Uh, it's just... Uh, the, the older I get, the, the the more I recognize the extent to which her songwriting has influenced mine uh, and her approach to songwriting and the poetry in her songwriting, uh, as well as the way she weds pop folk to jazz, which is something that's a big part of my uh, songwriting approach. Uh, Could you pick a favorite album? Many or? great classic yeah. albums, I would say Hajira, and, and that's partly because uh, that's uh, where uh, Jacobus Soros uh, really uh, plays such a, a, a fundamental, significant role uh, in the instrumentation and production of that album. Uh, and it really makes it something transcendent and unique uh, in its day. We come down now to the, the last two. What would you say is your greatest achievement to date? <laughs> well, um, Aside from uh, designing the first virtual reality, virtual reality video game for for national television, and aside for authoring the first consumer guide for synthesizers, and aside for building a musical atrium playground for the Eureka Children's Museum in, in Halifax, aside from all those things, uh, I, I, and you'll forgive me because it's it's a common uh uh you know uh vanity of songwriters to love the most recent thing they've done uh and uh there's a song on my most recent album my latest release american lullaby that actually the title track uh, which is called american lullaby um which uh is a an overview really of 400 years uh, of uh, American history, uh, starting back with uh, one of the first ships that sailed up the Hudson River uh, and uh, somehow in their uh, mind, somehow supposedly discovered uh, this new continent, even though people have been living here for it's not just centuries, but for thousands of years. Um, uh, and includes our, our story in America, the history of, uh, in large part, the violence that got us to where we are today, mm. um, including the massacre of the indigenous population and, and slavery, and uh, all, both abetted by our inexplicable love affair with guns. Uh, and I took it upon myself the challenge of trying to distill all of that history into uh, a, 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 like a six-minute pop song. And uh, uh, according to many reports, I, I might have gotten close to a, a achieving that goal. It's a song, it was a, it was a huge challenge. It was really difficult to wrestle with. But I, I'm really pleased and proud of the results of it because uh, I think it, it does tell a difficult story uh, in uh, a, a way I think people... Uh, can uh, that's approachable that that uh, that doesn't send people uh, yelling, running, screaming into the hills <laughs> when they listen uh, 
uh, to all these difficult topics. So I would say, uh, so far, and I don't feel like I'm done yet, but that song, American Lullaby, is one of my proudest achievements. And then finally, Dean Friedman, the last one. How do you wish to be remembered? Uh, well, as, I don't know, as, as a good guy uh, who, who didn't do too much harm uh, and w tried to be kind to people, uh, and also as an adept storyteller uh, with words and music. Um, and, uh, you know, like, uh, what's that Hippocratic Oath? Do no, first do no harm. That, 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 that's the first goal. And if I uh, am able to, to create content, songs, or whatever, uh, that give people some pleasure or distract them from uh, the difficult parts of life, uh, for a brief period of time, well, then job done. I think that's a very nice note to end on. I've really enjoyed our conversation for the last, I don't know, 70 minutes plus. You've been very accommodating with your time and it's been a fascinating journey to hear from the, the very beginnings to, to present day, what you've done in your career. And I find it fascinating from my point of view because... 12 months ago, I started writing lyrics for the first time myself. And I was just really interested to hear your take on kind of writing narrative and stories and experiences, observations. It's been fascinating. Cool. So thank you kindly. A pleasure. Thanks for having me. And uh, good to meet you, James. Catch you down the line. And lastly, I kind of wanted to ask you tour in the UK shortly. I wanted to ask when that will be and how we go about hearing more of your music and find out more about you sure thanks for asking you can find all that stuff on my website which is deanfriedman.com uh, i have a tour that runs from august through i'm sorry that starts april it kicks off april in wales um that runs from april through august it winds up at the edinburgh fringe festival and all those dates are on sale right now you can buy tickets uh today on my website in the gig section of deanfriedman.com. And uh, you can also, uh, that's where you can also find um, my albums and all kinds of other paraphernalia, including a couple of books I've written, including my uh, songwriter's handbook, which you might find uh, uh, of interest. Uh, it's sort of my take on my approach to, to sitting down in, in, in terms of the craft of songwriting. And, uh, so, yeah, I invite your listeners uh, or viewers to, to visit the website, uh, send me an email. I try to respond to everyone. And speaking of uh, uh, webcasts, I uh, have been doing for a while now since the lockdown. Uh, every month, the last Sunday of every month, I've been doing my own uh, webcast, my Dean Zine live stream, uh, and uh, uh, there are sometimes holiday specials. Uh, coming up is uh, on January Sunday, January 30th, 8 p.m. UK time. I'm celebrating uh, Groundhog's Day, a uh, big holiday here in America, although I'm celebrating it three days before Groundhog's Day. Groundhog's Day is officially February 2nd, but I'm, I'm doing it Sunday, the few days before. And tickets for that, it's a Zoom concert. It's a lot of fun, uh, a lot of silliness, and we have a good time, a lot of songs. Uh, and so I invite your listeners as well. Uh, to visit one of my Zooms and all that stuff, including the gigs and albums and everything else, uh, is at deanfriedman.com. Um, before we end, I'd, like yourself, I'd like to see a change and for artists to be, you know, honoured, compensated for the, the work they put out. And I'm sort of an advocate for, you probably can see some of the hard copies on my shelf. I, you know, try to buy as much music as I can of, as opposed to, to streaming. And I think you're right. There needs to be more of a, a level playing field because at the moment it's just, it just pretty much is daylight robbery, isn't it? It is indeed. Nothing less. But obviously a topic of long conversation, but thanks again. And I wish you all the very best for the future. And I hope to see you on the tour, to be honest. All right, I look forward to it, James. All right. You be well and I'll catch you down the line. Thank you kindly. 